In 1300 BC, Pharaoh Seti and his men have a meeting to discuss an incoming invasion. The Pharaoh asks the high priestess to use her divination powers to see the future, and the priestess kills a duck on the ritual table to use its organs. The resulting prophecy says that a person will be saved in the war and soon become a leader. It will either be General Moses or Prince Ramses, as they are in charge of the attack that will overthrow the Hittites at Kadesh. After the ritual, Seti gives Moses the prince's sword, and Ramses receives Moses, as it will set as a reminder of their brotherhood and protect each other at all cost. Then the young men leave to meet the armies, and Ramses and Moses ride a different carriage as the tropes follow them loyally. Arriving near Kadesh, Ramses discusses tactics with the commander and takes over the generalship and the distribution of forces to be sure they are victorious. Meanwhile the community of Hittites does their routine as a tribe without bothering anyone. Suddenly, a panicking Hittite soldier quickly approaches their tribe to alert everyone of the arrival of Egyptian soldiers, so the Hittites immediately prepare as soldiers collect their weapons and shields. Arriving near the Hittites' territory, Ramses signals his men to launch an attack. They shower the Hittites with arrows in order to target numerous enemies at once, this effectively kills multiple men and horses at the same time. Another wave of arrows is shot before the Egyptian soldiers march forward, colliding with the human shield created by the Hittites. The encounter between the Hittites and the Egyptians quickly becomes brutal, full of death and screaming everywhere. Unfortunately Ramses falls on his ride when it crashes on an arriving carriage. A Hittite soldier takes this chance to attack Ramses, but Moses uses a spear to save his friend from death. When the battle becomes impossible to handle and loss seems imminent, Moses orders his men to retreat and bring Ramses. Then Moses finds another carriage and rides it as they abandon Kadesh. On their way out, they still leave most of their men behind, fighting against the Hittites. When they arrive in Memphis, the people welcome them with cheers as they celebrate their return. Seti summons Moses to receive a report on the battle, and while Moses doesn't say the whole truth, he does mention that he saved Ramses' life. Seti thanks Moses for his deed and tells him that he is more capable of being a good leader for the kingdom than Ramses. Afterward, Seti, Moses, and Ramses listen to a lecture to learn more about their enemies. Seti stops the speaker and asks Ramses to rephrase the man's teachings, but Ramses just shrugs. The priest takes over and informs the king about the situation, mentioning the enslaved people in Patom. Seti decides to send Ramses to Patom to meet the viceroy and check the happenings in the area. Ramses seems hesitant with his father's orders, but he has no choice but to obey. Moses goes to Patom and studies the situation of the enslaved people, observing closely the ruling the viceroy has been exercising. Moses watches how enslaved people work in creating pyramids and a castle which gives comfort to the ruler to keep his spirits up during his service. Upon meeting the viceroy Hijep, Moses questions his ruling, not finding it fair. Hijep demands troops to maintain order and control over their slaves, which Moses doesn't approve of yet Hijep thinks it's perfectly effective. Moses invites Hijep to meet the people up close so he can confirm his philosophy is crazy, but Hijep turns down the idea. Later, Moses wanders around Patom to better understand the situation of the slaves, watching how hardworking the Hebrews are in building anything from statues to buildings. Moses also sees a man called Joshua being whipped by a guard, so he cuts in and stops him from being punished. To gather more information, Moses asks his men to gather the elders, who he suspects could cause rebellion in the future. While he chats with one of the slaves, he meets none, an elder with whom he has a conversation regarding religion and Canaan. Moses asks one of his soldiers to collect the names of all the elders, thinking he might find them useful in the future. When Moses leaves, he is stopped by Joshua to deliver a message from Nun asking him to meet him at the prayer house at night. After returning to the palace, Moses confronts Hijep over his management activities, demanding to check the report records from the projects and laws he has implemented. Being strict and honest, Moses tells Hijep to stop living and acting like royalty, reminding him he is not the king of Egypt. In the evening, Moses leaves to meet the elders in the prayer house. Nun asks him if he can send his guards outside before he starts narrating the Hebrew's own prophecy, explaining to Moses his background and origin. Moses is a child of Hebrew parents, but his sister sent him because at the time of his birth, there was an ongoing extermination of Jewish heirs. Moses gets mad upon hearing Nun's stories and decides to leave. Nun tries to stop him, so Moses orders the other elders to abandon the prayer house to finish hearing the story. Nun continues narrating how Moses reached the territory of Memphis and became affiliated with the royal castle, so he was raised by the Pharaoh's daughter. Moses still doesn't believe Nun and leaves the place, feeling irritated yet also confused about his identity. On his way out, spies from the prayer house label him as a traitor, so Moses fights them and immediately stabs them down. Meanwhile two Hebrews eavesdrop on the whole thing and report what they have heard to Hijep. Returning to Memphis, Moses is shocked to find the Pharaoh surrounded by doctors. Despite his current illness, Seti orders Moses to deliver his report regarding Patom. Moses reveals Hijep's awful slave regime, but Seti can tell that Moses discovered something more that still bothers him. However Moses never shares the truth. Days later, Seti passes away, and his successor Ramses performs the burial ceremony to send off his father's mummified body. Then Ramses takes over his father's throne. 
Sometime later, while Ramses and Moses together the advisors and generals discuss the king's plans, Hijep arrives with an important message, but first he asks for privacy. Ramses asks everyone to leave the room and Hijep proceeds to explain Moses' real heritage. After Hijep leaves, Ramses and Moses have a confrontation about Moses' secret. The king summons Seti's daughter Bithia and Moses' blood sister Miriam to ask for the full story, but they both keep the secret and swear Moses is Bithia's boy. Furious, Ramses threatens to hurt Miriam if Moses keeps on lying, so Moses surrenders and finally confesses the truth, for which he sent to jail. The queen advises Ramses to kill Moses, but Ramses still has doubts and sends Moses to exile instead. On his way out, Moses pleads with the guard to let him talk to Bithia and Miriam. Now that they're alone, Miriam finally admits the story is true and gives Moses the bracelet she removed from his hand when he was a child to protect him. For the following days, Moses struggles to survive in the desert because of the lack of food and the melting heat. Eventually he finds his sword hidden on the horse's back, but when the horse dies, Moses has no choice but to stop his wandering to decide how to proceed. While he's resting, two enemies pass by and decide to attack him. They try killing him with their swords, but Moses is still the best warrior in the land and defeats them both. Taking the enemy's horses and supplies, Moses continues his journey by traveling across the desert until he reaches the Red Sea. He notices a group of women retrieving water that is pushed away by a group of goat shepherds, demanding water for them first. Moses immediately cuts in and shows them his sword causing the men to back off and send their goats away from the water pump. Zipporah is very thankful for his help and invites Moses to their community to eat and rest. Zipporah's father interrogates Moses, but he doesn't share his story or his troubles just in case. At first Moses intends to just stop temporarily, but the longer he stays there, the more he likes it. In the end, Moses becomes a shepherd too, and he and Zipporah develop a romantic relationship that results in marriage. Nine years later, Ramses orders his men to build his tomb and palace, and hundreds of slaves are brought to Memphis for the task. Ramses demands the project to be done as fast as possible, disregarding the problems such speed may entail. Meanwhile Moses plays with his son Gershom and they discuss the legend of God's mountain. Moses never believed in such superstitions, which confuses the kid because the rest of the family is very devoted to their God. Later, Gershom tells Zipporah about his father's claims, which makes her confront Moses to discuss the education of their kid while he's out with his herd. It's raining rather heavily, but Moses still follows the sheep even when the water and the mud make it difficult to climb. The sheep go up the forbidden mountain and as Moses catches up to them, a landslide suddenly happens. The falling combination of mud and rocks pushes Moses to the ground and he soon loses consciousness. Hours later, Moses wakes up and finds himself buried in mud. Suddenly, he hears someone calling his name and notices a mysterious blue flame burning a few meters away from him. Then a child called Malik appears and while he makes a little pile of rocks, he reminds Moses that he is a general. He asks him to become a leader again and check on his people, who are having trouble. After the boy disappears, Moses is swallowed by the dirt. Sometime later, Moses wakes up at home after being rescued by Zipporah, who is attending to his wounds and broken leg. Moses tells her what he saw in the mountain, believing it to be a message from God. Zipporah doesn't believe him and says it's a delusional effect of his accident, so Moses has no choice but to tell her the whole truth about his past. Zipporah still thinks it's the pain talking and tells him to rest. When Moses recovers and tries to spend time with Gershom, he finds him making the same pile of rocks he saw on the mountain, and suddenly the kid gains Malik's face. Seeing as his destiny will never leave him alone, Moses finally comes to terms with the fact he needs to go back to Memphis. After preparing his horse and sword, Moses asks Gershom and Zipporah's permission, but both get mad at him for his decision, feeling like they're being abandoned. As soon as Moses arrives in Potom, he sees slaves getting burned day and night. He looks for the prayer house and finds none, Joshua, and a group of people who seem to be his blood relatives, including his brother. Meanwhile Ramses wakes up in the middle of the night feeling restless. He checks on his wife and his son before going to the horse, where Moses ambushes him and demands he frees the slaves or there will be consequences, saying he's been sent by God before leaving. The next day, Ramses announces Moses has lost his mind and orders his men to kill him and his family. Moses had said he isn't here for the throne, but Ramses still feels threatened by the prophecy. A whole army of Egyptian soldiers attacks Potom to locate Moses, but everyone protects him and they don't tell the soldiers where Moses is. Meanwhile Moses and his family hide underground to stay safe. Frustrated over the lack of progress, Ramses chooses to kill random Hebrew families until Moses shows himself. This move finally convinces slaves to join the army that will fight Ramses and his soldiers. Every day, the slaves work hard to make weapons and get ready to fight, but they also have to watch how more and more families get killed. Moses trains everyone on combat, archery, horse riding, and battle strategies so they are ready for anything Ramses may throw at them. Their first move will be to eliminate the Egyptian resources, which they achieve by spilling oil around the area to set an arson. As part of the city burns, the Hebrews take the chance to attack the Egyptians, burning their boats. Unfortunately, Ramses retaliates by sending his soldiers to burn the slaves' homes. 
Sometime later, Moses talks to Malik to discuss their next move. Malik thinks things are going too slow, so he tells Moses to rest while he takes some action in the form of ten plagues. Soon nature turns against Egypt, crocodiles attack Egyptian boats, and the Nile River turns absolutely red with blood, which kills all the fish and the plants. The second plague consists of hundreds of frogs suddenly taking over the city, especially the royal palace. The third is an invasion of lice and gnats that bring a bad smell and make everything dirty, not to mention their attack on the food. The fourth plague fills the city with flies that bring skin diseases to the citizens and even start affecting Ramses too, it also kills the crops. The Hebrews send a message to Ramses, saying he must free them or the plagues will get worse. However this only angers Ramses and he makes the slaves work even more. Moses tries to talk to God, wondering who exactly is being punished considering the slaves are suffering as well. The next plague is a pestilence of livestock, which starts killing big animals like the cows that provide milk and the royal horses. Hunger becomes an extremely severe problem, yet Ramses keeps on killing Hebrews as punishment. Another plague is the appearance of boils on everyone's skin. The seventh plague is a thunderstorm of hail that even brings a hurricane near the area. Moses is feeling frustrated with God and his choices, but Malik is far from gone. The eighth plague sends a bunch of locusts that cover the whole city and ruin the remaining crops. Ramses' advisors warn him that people are hungry, but Ramses refuses to share his own provisions. The citizens try to enter the castle to steal food, yet Ramses sends his soldiers to kill them in a horrible massacre. Ramses' royal assistants are starting to turn against him and leave the castle. Afterward, a bolt of lightning hits the city and leaves it in darkness, which is the ninth plague. Desperate, Ramses goes to pray to his own gods and challenges Moses' deity, threatening to kill every Hebrew child. Meanwhile Moses meets with Malak, demanding things to stop because Hebrews are suffering too. Malak refuses because kings that think of themselves as gods deserve to be punished. Then Malak tells Moses about Ramses' threat and shares his idea for the tenth plague, which Moses absolutely hates. As the plague of darkness finally goes away, Moses goes to Ramses' palace to inform him that if he doesn't let the slaves go before sunset, something terrible will happen to his child. Afterward Moses goes to see his allies and orders them to kill a lamb to mark their doors using its blood, this will keep them safe from the tenth plague. The Hebrews do as Moses says and go to bed in peace, but Ramses is nervous and sits next to his son all night. At midnight a mysterious darkness covers the city, and one by one every Egyptian child slowly loses their breath once it passes through their bodies. Ramses checks on his son and is devastated to see he's dead as well. The next day, Ramses and his soldiers go to Moses to show his dead baby and call Moses God a child murderer. However Moses informs him no Hebrew kid died, proving he's on the side of the right God. A furious Ramses refuses to accept this and kicks all the Hebrews out of Egypt. While the Hebrew community finally leaves the slave days behind, Ramses and his wife say goodbye to his son. His grief makes him decide he'll follow the Hebrews and kill them all to get revenge. Meanwhile Moses guides the Hebrews through the desert in the direction of the Red Sea. The people are tired, but Moses pushes them to walk because they won't be safe until they cross the sea. When they hear Ramses and his men are coming after them, Moses chooses to go through the highlands to stop the chariots from following them quickly. Sometime later, they find a fork in the road, and Moses asks for Malik's help, but Malik never answers his prayers. Disappointed, Moses chooses what he feels is right. Eventually the Hebrews reach the Red Sea up front instead of around it, and Moses refuses to accept he was wrong, so he tells his people this is just a break to rest. However when he's alone, Moses tells God he's failed everyone and throws his sword into the sea. Minutes later, a falling light enters the water. The next morning, the Hebrews find lots of birds flying above them and the sword floating on the surface. When Moses grabs it, the waters behave strangely, and Moses realizes this is the right moment to cross. The people are scared, but Moses convinces them to believe with a heartful speech. As the waters move to allow the Hebrews to pass, Ramses orders his chariots to hurry, causing them to go too fast on the mountains and many of them fall in the way. A landslide also kills many soldiers, so Ramses allows half his army to go back. The Hebrews finish crossing the sea, so by the time Ramses and his men arrive, the waters are returning to their original place. Ramses' men run away but many of them still are drowned by the waves. Only Ramses stays, and Moses comes back to confront him, but before they can clash their swords, the sea takes them both and the rest of the Egyptian soldiers. Moments later, Moses and Ramses appear on opposite shores. While Moses talks to his people, Ramses finds his entire army dead and realizes he isn't so powerful anymore. A few days later, Moses guides the Hebrews to his home and he reunites with Gershom and Zipporah, who receive him warmly. While the Hebrews settle down, Moses goes to Mount Sinai and meets with Malak, who tells him the Ten Commandments that will serve as the law of his people. Make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you can watch more videos like this. Thanks for watching.